Good evening. My name is Sarah Slade and I'm Director of the Project Management Office here at the State Library. This seminar is being held on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation and I wish to acknowledge them as the traditional owners. I would also like to pay my respects to their elders and to the elders of other communities who may be here this evening. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the policy pitch presented by Grattan Institute and State Library Victoria. I'd like to give a warm welcome to tonight's speakers, Dr. Stephen Duckett, Associate Professor Jill Sewell and Dr. Linda Swan, Grattan Institute members and staff and friends of the library. The Project Management Office was formed at the library in December to oversee the coordination of a range of projects currently underway at the library. These include two major construction projects, Vision 2020, our building redevelopment here in Swanson Street, and our second Ballarat offsite store. We're very excited about opening these new spaces for the public in various stages, starting this spring when we'll open our new Russell Street entrances. And if you're interested in seeing the new designs and keeping abreast of the building redevelopment, I encourage you to take a look at our website. Those of you who've come to a number of policy pitches will notice that we're not in the theatreette as usual, and that's because that's one of the spaces that's currently being redeveloped. We're delighted to partner with Grattan Institute to present this series. The policy pitch brings to the library new audiences, professionals, and public policy makers in the fields of law, health, environment, energy, politics, and higher education. We're pleased to observe how engaged you are with this series and thank you all for contributing to creating a space for discussion and reflection on important policy issues. The topic this evening is safer care saves money. About one in every nine patients suffer a complication in hospital. In addition to the consequences for the patient, these complications add to healthcare costs. I'm pleased to now introduce Dr. Stephen Duckett, who will present the data on the costs of complication rates and potential new strategies to reduce adverse events. He will then lead a discussion with experts in the healthcare field, Jill Saul and Linda Swan. Stephen is Director of the Health Program at Grattan Institute. He has a reputation for creativity, evidence-based innovation and reform in areas ranging from the introduction of activity-based funding for hospitals to new systems of accountability for the safety of hospital care. Please join me in welcoming Jill, Linda and Stephen. Thanks, Sarah. And I too would like to acknowledge uh, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional owners of this land, and also reflect that uh, it, there's been a number of studies of the quality of care that Aboriginal people have received in Australian hospitals, and all of those studies have shown a similar result, that uh, Aboriginal people have poorer quality care generally than non-Aboriginal people, higher uh, discharged against advice rates and so on. So we need to reflect that this, uh, that acknowledgement of country is something that has significance uh, about healthcare delivery today. I'd also remind you of the Twitter handles and hashtags that are there for, uh, for today. Um, I'm going to talk to you about two uh, reports uh, that we've done, or, or draw on two reports we've done, and also talk about uh, a report that we've got underway that we're aiming to release uh, in the middle of this year. And that report is the, the, the first report we did in this safety series looked at the current uh, way we, we measure safety and uh, looked at uh, the, the, the number of different ways that safety is, uh, is measured and said that basically all of the current ways of measuring need improvement, but that's not to say we can't use the data they've got. And the second report uh, was basically descriptive epidemiology, looking at uh, the, the prevalence of uh, complications and made some recommendations in particular that we should publish more about that, we should let the, the public into our confidence, and also we need to make sure that hospitals, clinicians have the data they, they need to be able to address the complications that we see. So I'm gonna talk about three, three things. First of all, a bit about how big the problem is, uh, what, uh, something about financial incentives, and something about governance initiatives 
such as accreditation, as ways of addressing some of these problems. But first, uh, how big is the problem? Well, uh, there are a number of ways that uh, policy uses to address, uh, to measure complications. The most common is um, sentinel events, uh, sometimes called never events, a, a quite strange term when you think about it because there's about 100 of those occur every year. Um, and these, and, and right at the moment, there's a financial incentive on the states collectively uh, that, that these shouldn't occur. Uh, come the 1st of July this year, there's a financial incentive on the states collectively uh, about a, a smaller, a, a list of so-called designated hospital acquired complications. And that applies in about 2% uh, or so of all cases or 9% of overnight stays. And of course, then there is a list of all the complications that might occur, and that's much more frequently frequently occurring, about nine percent of all, eleven percent of all uh, complication of all hospital admissions, and twenty five percent of overnight. And of course, for again peculiar reasons, uh, policy focuses on the least frequent rather than the most frequent, which I, you know when you think about it is pretty peculiar. But anyway, there you go. Um, if we el eliminated, there, as I said, there are about 11% of all admissions have a complication. If you eliminated all the ones that are on the designated hospital acquired complications list, you reduce that number trivially. Um, but if you reduce the rate to the, the rate that, uh, of all complications that is seen in the, in the top 25% of hospitals, you have a a, a reduction of a, a, few, a few more percent and a, and a couple more percent if you get it down to the bottom decile, the, the, the best 10 per cent of hospitals. So we could get rid of about a quarter of all the complications if we could have all hospitals performing at the rate that the best 10 per cent of hospitals do. So we've now made some estimates of the cost of complications. I'd stress that these are estimates um, and we've rounded them in this table but not the next one. And so some complications cost more than $20,000. Just to put that in context, the, the cost of an average admission to a hospital in this country is about $5,000. And so you, know, you, you can add significantly to the cost of admission with a complication. But those ones luckily are very unusual. They're, you know, the, the numbers of the times that they occur is quite small. This is the other graph which says, let's look across all the complications, not just the, the expensive ones. And what we see here is the relatively frequent, but each of them less, less costly, adds a lot. And so in the end, we have hundreds of millions of dollars added to the, the cost of the healthcare system, in fact, billions of dollars added to the cost of the healthcare system because of the complications that occur. And so this means that in addition to the pain and the suffering and the consequences for the individual patient, complications actually cost money. So it phrased differently, safer care saves money. Now this graph uh, looks at a particular set of complications, namely complications for uh, medical cardiology complications, and we've taken into account all of the, 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 the complications that occur in, the, in that group of patients. And what we've done here is said, because of the activity-based funding arrangements that occur in hospitals, uh, the, the hospital actually gets extra revenue for having a complication. That is, uh, Hospitals get funded according to activity-based funding. There's a thing called a DRG, which is a way of describing the hospital and uh, the patient. And if you have a complication, you may move up to a higher rate of payment. So what we've estimated is how much extra revenue the hospital gets from having complications. And we've also estimated how much the complications actually cost the hospital. Sorry, this is for all patients, not just medical cardiology. I'm sorry, I made a mistake there. So this is all complications, all patients, how much extra revenue they get <clears throat> and how much extra cost they have. And basically, what we see is, in these are the, the, hospital, the 20 or so biggest hospitals in the country. What we see here 
is that in every instance, the cost to the hospital of those complications is greater than the revenue they get. Or phrased, and, and in fact, it's even more than that. This line is, the cost is more than twice the revenue they get. And in, again, we see in more or less every case, the revenue that the hospital get is, is half what the complication, the cost of those complications. Now this is very significant because what it means is, even if government did nothing, there's a financial incentive on hospitals to try and reduce complications because the, the revenue they get is much less than the, co the cost of those complications so that they, they can actually improve their bottom line by reducing the complication rates. It's something we'll come to later. Now what I showed you earlier in that table was the total cost of complications. Now you can't eliminate all of those costs, you can't eliminate all of those complications. So what we've done in this slide is say, what, how much do you think we could save by reducing complications? So we had two measures of reducing complications. So our total cost of complications here is about five billion. We've, we've subsequently done some re-estimation and dropped that estimate down to about three and a half, but uh, we're still writing this report, so you're getting an early, an early dose of it. But anyway, what happens if we could get the rate of complications down to what we see in the best 25% of hospitals or in the best 10% of hospitals? And again, what we're showing here is that there's probably about a billion and a half dollars of savings each year across public and private hospitals. If we could get the rate of complications down to what we see in the best 10% of hospitals. And we don't believe that's an impossible ask. Importantly, you can think about what that means in every, country, in every state or territory, and it means about 400 million savings every year uh, in Victoria, which is the size of a medium-sized hospital, not our biggest hospitals, but a medium-sized hospital uh, probably of the, I don't know, sunshine-sized hospital uh, every year. Now this is a pretty awful graph, but basically what we, re what we show uh, across the bottom and across the, 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 the X and the Y axis, the horizontal and the vertical axis, are the same specialties. And we've regressed the um, complication rate in one specialty against another. And if it's either directly vertical or directly horizontal, it means there's basically no relationship between the complication rate in one specialty and the complication rate in another specialty. Now what this means is this, if you are designing a, a policy which says we're going to apply a policy as if a hospital is a single entity, then it doesn't make any sense because there will be different complications in different specialties. And the, the rate of complications in one specialty doesn't predict the rate of complications in another specialty. So your policy design has to be specialty specific if it's going to make any sense. And it won't surprise you to know that the current policies aren't specialty specific, so they don't make any sense. Uh, this slide just shows you the range. And so uh, the orange dots uh, are deciles, are groups of 10% uh, of hospitals uh, for each of common sorts of complications. And again, you can see the, the, the huge range there is across the country in the in the rate of complications after you've standardised for um, patient factors. And so this is the extra risk that a given hospital, the, the top decile or the worst decile or the best decile hospital, what the extra risk it entails in going to the worst decile of hospitals for that sort of complication. And we've got uh, another measure of complications there, which is the... Um, measure of the most com costly complications. And so we looked at the, at the 20 or 30 or so complications which were the most expensive. And of course, there's fewer of those, and so there's, uh, but there's still quite a spread across hospitals in that. And again, it's showing you how much you can, imp you can reduce the rates and so on. I'll skip that slide. What we're showing here is there are a number of instruments that you can use to influence policy. Policy is about changing the behaviour of individuals, communities, professionals, uh, uh, and, uh, and institutions. And you can use a number of instruments to try and change that. And in our previous report, we've talked about 
providing more information into the public domain, a, an information sort of strategy. We've also talked in that report about um, providing feedback to hospitals, providing public uh, accountability, and also we're starting to talk about governance initiatives as, as well. We now want to talk about financial incentives, yet another one of these levers that we might think about. Now, the problem with financial incentives is uh, I'm an economist, so I am genetically programmed to say the word financial incentives every three hours of my life. And I, as, as, a, as a factor in, in my belief system, I believe that financial incentives work, and they actually do, and you can see they do work, but they may not work all the time and in every cir circumstance. But certainly what we've seen over the last few decades has been an evolution in safety thinking. In initially, uh, safety issues were seen as a secret doctor's business. Uh, we talked about it between consenting adults in private and, and the policy responses were directed at trying to protect that secret doctor's business. Over time, we began to realise that safety was more of a systems issue. Then we started to realise there was a public issue and we started talking about publishing uh, information about safety and quality events. And then we started talking about safety being a payer issue and so people paying for healthcare started to think about it and talk about it and, and introduce policies about it. And we're at the moment in those last two stages of, of uh, thinking about what we think about safety. And, th and, and uh, in our previous report, we looked at it as safety as a public issue. In this report, we're beginning to look at the financial incentives. Now, the problem is the evidence about paper performance and financial incentives is poor. And uh, you'll see this is a, a systematic review that was undertaken of the effect of pay performance or financial incentives. And basically, if you look at this column and what is the strength of the evidence, it, it, it doesn't look good. And so we've got to be really careful about thinking that financial incentives are going to work. Now, they, they still may work. I'm not saying they don't, but we've got to be careful about it. And there are a number of reasons why this is. There are very, very few doctors and healthcare professionals who get up in the morning and say, I'm going to work today and what I really want to do today is make a mistake and hurt someone. Very unusual for that to happen. And so the, the motivation, the intrinsic motivation for health professionals is to actually do the right thing. And the financial incentives on the organisation may or may not impact on them at all. And so the actual care delivery may not be impacted by most designs. But that doesn't stop us introducing a set of financial incentives. As I said, nationally, the uh, chief ministers, premiers, prime minister and the health ministers have all endorsed a national approach. I've called it here the national apparent approach, where, for example, sentinel events are this list of designated, uh, short list of sentinel events. The episode doesn't get any payment in the Commonwealth payment to the states uh, from the 1st of July of last year. And then there's, from the 1st of July this year, there are so-called designated complications. Uh, um, they're called the HACs, the hospital-acquired hospital complications. And there, uh, they estimate the chance of a, a complication and, and there's a differential payment uh, if uh, a complication occurs. They, they make a, an adjustment. Now, this is the way it's described. This is the rhetoric. Um, this is what's ha supposed to happen. And here's the list of the hacks in this list. And here's the apparent reduction in the payment on that column. And I'm using the word apparent because nothing is as it seems. Uh, in fact, even though there's a lot of rhetoric in the healthcare system about these uh, financial incentives applying at the moment, you can effectively ignore them ignore that discussion because, in fact, they don't work as they are described to work. Um, so there are a number of reasons why they don't work as they describe to work, but one is that they don't apply in every case. Uh, so you say, did, you, did a hack occur? Well, no, so there's no impact anyway. Um, was the rate of complications constant? And if the rate is complicated, so the, uh, the, the financial penalty doesn't apply to the base rate of complications, it only applies to the change in the base rate of complications. So if there's no change, there's no penalty. So that most, most and that's, the change is at the hospital level, not any other level. 
And then, because of the way the funding arrangements from the Commonwealth to the state work, um, if you're a state which has got a high growth rate in total activity, it doesn't apply to you anyway because the, the impact's capped by that total growth rate. And finally, um, you may actually have an apparent impact. However, that impact is overridden by the Grants Commission who doesn't take any notice of all of that funding formula and so there is no impact in the end on individual states. Uh, there's an impact on the states collectively. So there's hardly anybody in the country who understands how the Grants Commission works, so there's probably hardly anybody in the country who understands how this works anyway. So there's almost no impact. So even though a lot of discussion, a lot of paper has been written, it actually is irrelevant. Um, so I've shown you this graph already. What this means, because the revenue exceeds, uh, the, the revenue is less than the, the, the cost, you can actually write a business case for quality. So it is now, as I said, it is now already, without any additional financial incentives, it's already in the interest of hospitals to uh, try and save, save uh, reduce complications, setting aside any impact they have on, hospital, on patients. And of course, the problem is most hospital managers don't understand that, and so what we've got to do is think about how we actually increase the uh, attention to business cases for quality. Now, this one is the one where we just looked at medical cardiology, and this time we looked at is the hospital efficient or inefficient, and is it worse or better in its, in its complication rates? And so the horizontal axis is whether it's got a higher rate of complications or a lower rate of complications, and these are higher rate and these are lower rate, and the vertical axis is whether it's more efficient or less efficient uh, in terms of cost per patient treated. And so you can obviously uh, have four quadrants here. Um, the, the costly and uh, worse performing in terms of complication rates and so on and so forth. And you can think about, you know, this, this is not the quadrant you want your hospital to be in. And uh, I won't say they're totally doomed, um, but it, it's actually going to be hard for them to do anything because they don't really have much slack in their budget because they're already more expensive than everybody else and they've got a big task. You've got these ones where you can tell them to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. So they've got some slack in their budget because they're efficient, and so you can just go ahead and fix yourself. Um, I don't know what to do in this quadrant um, uh, because they're, <coughs> they're more efficient. Oh, they're, 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 they've got lower rates of complications, but they're less efficient, so um, they, they need to be addressing their efficiency anyway, but uh, they should probably, they could possibly improve their efficiency by actually reducing complications even more than they are. And in this quadrant, you've got, there's a still a spread that, that, that uh, there, are, there is best practice right down here, and some of these can actually improve themselves. So you've got to think about tailored, working out where the hospital is and, and how your financial incentives, financial penalties on this group is, is probably not going to be very useful because they've already got financial penalties on them because they're less efficient than everybody else. There are lots of barriers to use of business cases uh, because often it's not part of the culture um, and, and so we've got to think about how we promote business cases. When I talked about financial incentives, there are a huge variety of financial incentives and a huge variety of designs. It might be that the designs where we're implementing now are just poor designs and different designs might work better. So again, if we're going to think about different financial incentives, we need to think about different ways of doing it. So, um, as I said, I'll just skip that, but basically there are lots and lots of choices in financial incentives and uh, tailoring them and making them more specially specific is probably the right way to go. Um, I'll skip that. I'll skip that. Sorry about this. We're just running. I'm running a bit more over time than I should have. Um, financial incentives bring with them risks, including risks of um, gaming, risks of uh, uh, perverse incentives, and so on that we need to think about. So, moving off financial incentives onto accreditation, the 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 main way of improving 
systematic way of strengthening quality at the moment is so-called hospital accreditation. Um, unfortunately, the evidence about whether hospital accreditation works or not is pretty weak. Um, in fact, it's fair to say that if you did a systematic review, on average, it will be shown not to work. And there are a, a number of reasons for this. Uh, partly, there's lack of evidence for the standards that are being proposed, or that are used, and there's, there's huge inter-rater reliability and so on. So we've got to think about what, how might accreditation evolve? One, I should be careful about how I describe accreditation because I've got a vested interest in it. I have shares in Australian paper mills and accreditation produces a lot of paper. It produces a lot of paper and so that there is a major benefit to the share price uh, with accreditation visits. There have been some studies of accreditation. This one is a very interesting one. This was looking at unannounced surveys, uh, which is a methodology used elsewhere in other countries. And what it shows is there's a real impact of the accreditation visit in uh, complication rates or mortality. And you can see that during the week of the, of the accreditation visit, there's actually an improvement in care, but there's no, but the week before and the week after, there's no change. So it's really uh, quite, an interesting, uh, quite an interesting study, but it doesn't give you great faith that accreditation is a good system. Now, one of the reasons is that it, we have to think about this is because of uh, the way hospitals work. Uh, this is um, drawing on some theories of a, a, a Canadian uh, organisation theorist called Henry Mintzberg, uh, who looked at different parts of an organisation, but he described hospitals as a professionalised bureaucracy. That is, the, 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 the main work was done here by independent professionals, essentially, who are like organising cats. Uh, and accreditation is about upward accountability. It's about quality assurance and often creates tension between the management side of the organisation and the professional side of the organisation because, as I said in the previous slide, the, there's a dissonance between um, the clinicians often don't think the accreditation actually is responding to issues that they think are important. Another way we could think about it is to think about quality improvement approaches which are about responding to the interests and uh, incentives and aspirations of, of the clinicians. And so we could think about, is the quality assurance, the upward accountability system the right way? And should we be rebalancing accreditation towards more of a quality improvement focus? And if you're going to do that, you might also think about rebalancing accreditation towards more of an accountability focus. Now, to be fair, the Council of the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality Healthcare is actually moving in that direction. And so what they're also talking about is moving to a focus on outcomes, as we see in this um, uh, real life uh, discussion, the infection, there's an increase in antibiotic resistant organisms, which could result in increased increased presence of regulatory surveillance. So the idea is that you'd, you'd initiate a, 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 an accreditation visit if your um, antibiotics rate went up. So uh, what might a new accreditation system look like? Well, it might start by providing data to the hospitals. At the moment, the accreditation visit is independent of the actual observed reality of the hospital. So you does, whether you've got a higher or low rate of infection doesn't affect the, how your accreditation visit occurs. And so you might start by actually having, looking at different outcome measures, looking at uh, patient measures, looking at clinician measures, uh, and so on. Um, and these would be specialty specific because, as I said, you've got to actually address the specialty, specialty specific issues. You might start, you might also then say to the hospital, well, here's the data. You've got a higher rate than infections than everybody else. What are you doing about it? What is your plan for addressing that? And then you have a discussion with the hospital about that. What, what are they doing? And the accreditation visit is then about engaging with the hospital about what their strategies are to address their specific initiative, their specific problems. And you also make sure that the accreditation surveyors are named in the, in the report. You publish the report, make it available. So there's some accountability for the accreditation surveyors not to be idiosyncratic. 
and you release the report and what the hospital is doing about it, and the cycle starts all over again. So this is changing accreditation from an accountability focus to an improvement focus and to an outcomes-driven focus. And of course, you can't do this overnight, so you have to phase out the, the, the accountability one as you phase in the different one. And so I'd be interested in your views about this. Um, you know, when is it that you want to move from one to another? When, when you're more than halfway there and so on? And so I've got four questions here that I'm going to ask you later on for your views about a different model of accreditation. Because we've done a draft report and we've sent it out and we've got two responses. One person said, this is hopeless, you've got to have process-driven accreditation. Um, I've got experience of fridges not being monitored properly, so you've got to actually keep that. And we've got another person saying, accreditation is simply an event, it's hopeless at the moment, why don't you move, to, you've got to move towards this quality improvement outcomes driven focus. So I've got four questions there that I'm going to ask you to vote on later on this evening. So um, he, we're also, as I said, you've got to be special, specially specific. And we have lots of accreditation, not just general hospital accreditation, but specialty training accreditation. And so each specialty goes and accredits a hospital for whether it's a suitable place for training uh, surgeons or training uh, radiologists or whatever, whatever. Now at the moment, they don't take into account the complication rate of that hospital when they're approving, the when they're approving them for, for specialty training. They do take into account uh, the size of the hospital, whether they've got a number of staff and so on. Now there are two hypotheses. It might be that the best place to train new orthopaedic surgeons, for example, is in a place which has got a high rate of complications because they'll see all these problems and learn how to deal with all these problems and that will be with them for the rest of their life. Alternatively, you might say, we're only going to, send, we're only going to train orthopaedic surgeons in the better hospitals because we want to train them in best practice. Now, I think the right answer is the latter, but you could argue the former, but in any event at the moment, they don't take any notice of complication rates, so they train, they just send them out randomly to learn random things. Anyway, um, so I'll skip that. So what we're saying is you need to totally change the governance mechanisms. You need to rethink the, the path we're going on on financial incentives to actually try and address these issues about uh, Safety, safety and quality of care and trying to actually have a much better system to try and change it. So um, you've got some handouts on your chair about uh, how to log in. So you can log into your iPhones or other sorts of phones. Um, and the, we've got four questions that we're going to ask you. And there they all are. So what we're interested in is what is your response? You know, assuming the data are good enough, uh, to what extent is it a good idea to move to an outcome based? To what extent is a good idea uh, to uh, have, have a different form of accountability? Um, when is the earliest that you could see it? Uh, and when is the earliest you could move to an outcome based? So I'd be really interested in your views. So log in, fill in the answers, and then we'll see what everybody says. All right, you had your chance. Um, whoa. So this is assuming the data are good enough, to what extent is a shift to an outcome focus the right way to go? And basically everybody says it's uh, the right way to go with some some to a greater extent than, than others. Then the next question was, ooh. <laughs> so the late, the late answer is uh, more conservative than the earlier answers. Then we asked, um, assuming the data are good enough, to what extent is a shift to an improvement focus the right way to go? And as I said, when we sent the report out, we had divergent answers on this, on this question. Um, You've got less divergent answers on this, uh, this question in this audience. So most of you are saying it's uh, an improvement focus is, is the way to go. 
And then we said, when, when, when is the earliest you could see a shift from predominantly processed to predominantly um, uh, outcome oriented? Most say it's not uh, in the very near future, but see, there's a fair few saying in the next five to 10 years, which might mean never, never, but you know, that, uh, that uh, quite a few say this is the sort of direction that's a five to 10 year direction. And then we finally said, uh, what is the earliest you could move to an outcome focused improvement um, orientation? And again, it looks, oh, next few years. Um, but you know, again, it, it's, there's more in the next few years than I, th than I thought. So thank you very much for your involvement. I'd now like to invite uh, Linda, oh, <laughs> Linda, oh, Jill Sewell next. Um, sorry about that, uh, to talk about, uh, Thank you very much. Hi, good evening, everybody, and thanks very much, Stephen, for this invitation to contribute to this discussion tonight and to respond to some of the things that you've been talking to us tonight. So I'm going to speak mainly from my perspective as chair of the Victorian Clinical Council, and I'm going to explain that a bit because it's a relatively new institution in Victoria, and many of you may not know much about it. So. Um, when Stephen Duckett and his team wrote the Targeting Zero report for the Department of Health and Human Services, which was all about improving safety and quality in the healthcare systems in Victoria, he made a number of recommendations. And one of the recommendations was to set up the Victorian Clinical Council, um, which is as a forum for a multidisciplinary and very diverse group of clinicians and consumers to provide collective clinical leadership and strategic advice on the delivery of high quality health care with the aim of improving health outcomes for all Victorians. And to be set up as a relatively independent body, it's not part of the Department of Health, but it sits alongside the Department of Health. It's resourced through Safer Care Victoria, which was also set up as a consequence of Stephen's report. And um, as chair of the Victorian Clinical Council, I am responsible to the secretary of the department in the advice that we give her. We commenced uh, our work in January last year, so we're a very new organisation. And so we provide advice to the secretary, high level systems advice to the secretary of the department on matters relating to quality improvement, design of policy programs, and most importantly on effective engagement um, of, in clinical matters. And this was really, I think Stephen's main recommendation that clinical engagement with the department needed to be much stronger, consistent and uh, valued for the insights that come from uh, people working on the ground. And this advice was to cover both in the public system, the private system and community care. Uh, and we have a t we, the Victorian Clinical Council consists of about 70 members. Uh, about one third of those members are, if you like, ex officio, depending on roles that they already have in association with the department. And about two thirds were developed through an expression of interest and really represent a very diverse group of all, all across all clin uh, clinicians, um, across all different types of health services, a significant geographic diversity, a significant um, experience diversity, and including about 10% of consumers. Um, now, although it's, as I said, it's ind an independent body, it is resourced through Safer Care Victoria, and Safer Care Victoria was all set up, also set up as a result of Stephen Duckett's report. Um, which is really, its role is to oversee and support health services to provide safe, high quality care. It's really, I think it's the implementation arm of safety and quality initiatives in Victoria. It's also responsible for another major group uh, area of clinical engagement, which is the Victorian clinical networks, which are specialty or disease specific. And they are groups of health professionals with some organisations and also consumers who work to achieve a shared goal of high quality care in their particular specialty area. So there's cardiac, there's renal, there's paediatric, there's um, acute care, uh, maternity and perinatal. Those are the sorts of descriptions of the clinical care networks. And they are, their aim is to identify best practice 
and to use those uh, and to try and reduce clinical variation across the system and to develop statewide safety improvement goals and advise on data collection. There was also another organisation set up, VAHI, which is which is um, the data collection agency now developed. All of these agencies have been set up a little bit independently of the actual department, which, which is an interesting, provides an interesting governance model for how we all learn to work together. So that's a little bit about the background. Um, and so, I'm, as I know, I'm speaking now with uh, the experience of 15 months of working, 15, 16 months working with the Victorian Clinical Council. Uh, which meets about four times a year for a day at a time to discuss particular topics and provide, develop and provide advice to the, uh, to the secretary. So S Stephen has given us a presentation tonight which um, demonstrates a quite evident fact that complications have consequences for individual patients, some of which can be very significant consequences. Significant, con significant consequences for healthcare costs. And it's interesting because you would imagine that, as Stephen has demonstrated, that the costs of complications are far, far higher than the increased revenue that hospitals get by um, getting um, higher DRG rates for complicated cases. But somehow it hasn't translated into as much change as you would think that that incentive would drive. But it, it also has in, uh, significant opportunity costs for other people's care, anything that that increases length of stay and, um, and increases cost, then one way or another that's going to reduce the capacity for other patients to be, to be treated in that particular system. Um, so um, he's demonstrated quite clearly that cost, care is improved and costs are decreased by decreasing complication rates in every clinical setting. It's not just about the the main teaching hospitals, it's about all hospitals, but the arguments are very, although the funding models are different, the arguments are going to be the same, whether you're talking about public systems, private systems, or community systems. But I would also add that safer care, in this sense, increases trust in the healthcare system, which is really critical. What, what trust does the community have in our system to provide equitable and safe healthcare? So I think that in that process it, it contributes to the equitable outcomes of the health system when all parts are performing well and that will in itself increase access to, access to care for other people. So I'm not going to go into the detail of Stephen's discussion about financial incentives, he be a health economist and me not, but he's really presenting strong evidence that the current and imminent financial systems that he incentives that he described are very complex against a complex funding background anyhow in Australia federal system. They're set at a high level, they're difficult to translate at, a, at the clinical level and I quite agree with this, they're highly targeted against sentinel events and a list of, is it about 16 hospital acquired complications? And that argument that says that if you just concentrate on the most expensive complications and improve them, you'll save a certain amount of money. But if you, if you save a little bit of money on lots and lots of complications, that will be more money saved overall. And I think you can use the principles of improvement across all complications, not just those very expensive or very severe complications. Um, the highly targeted means that it, those are the areas that tend to, get tend to get concentrated on and so other areas that need improvement will tend to be left inside. There's no major incentive. There might be a clinical incentive to do it, but the system that's coming down from above is not giving an incentive to, to improve those other complications. So I agree with the theme of recent, the recent Grattan Institute reports and repeated here that information is absolutely key and that improved data systems should put relevant information into the hands of hospitals and, importantly, clinicians. Stephen constantly urges that the state's priority should be to support clinicians in quality improvement at the clinical unit level with accurate longitudinal and then comparative data about clinical outcomes, about complications, and also to help clinicians have a better understanding about cost implications for um, of complications, not just for their own setting, but across the whole hospital. And this is very consistent with the theme, with the recognised value of clinician engagement, which is, the, as I said, the prime purpose of the Victorian Clinical Council. At all of our meetings so far, 
our members constantly support the need for effective, meaningful and real-time data for clinicians to use in their quality improvements activities wherever they work. And our consumer members are hot and strong on this. They want publicly available data to inform real understanding about what the health service offers and the differences between different health services, and, and which leads to their true choice with, across the health system. And they've, they're very powerful in their advocacy for this sort of choice. Stephen's been talking about uh, financial data this afternoon, but we need to remember also that clinical data can be presented in a number of different ways. And there's a real risk of too much data from too many sources, which can really overload clinicians. You can get data coming at you from all over the place. Um, so it, it's really important to develop a shared understanding of relevant data, and minimally relevant data in the sense that just use the minimal amount that you need to actually make a difference. And that will include the Department of Health collection, risk adjustment, reporting, and monitoring for health services. And this is the sort of work that VAHI is developing in a more sophisticated way, reporting to clinicians, to executives, to boards, and also public reporting. But we also need to think about how data interacts with other sorts of data, like specialty registries, registries which is a, this is clinical data about particular diseases, which are held in a variety of hands, some held by colleges, some held by the, by the professional, the specialty professional bodies, and sometimes held by health departments. And then there are clinical quality registers, which the Australian Commission for Health and Safety in, in uh, Quality and Safety in Healthcare have developed with an overarching framework, but again with a set of priorities, which were which were published in 2016. So they said, look, here's the top five priorities, here's the next five priorities, and this is what you should be working on. And once again, once you start to target priorities, you forget about the other areas. I'm a paediatrician, and paediatric issues never get up on priorities because We've got a sm smaller number of sick children than, than elderly people, so we're always a pimple on a pumpkin, and we never get considered. And there's a lot of other small specialty areas that don't, because the priorities are all about volume. And so I think it's really critical um, to think across the board about complications and priorities and improvement and measurement, rather than concentrating on, on highly targeted areas. So it's very interesting to hear Stephen go on to discuss hospital accreditation, as he said, mandated by the Australian Commission for Safety and Quality. Recently reviewed, new standards are being just about put into place, and it's interesting that you call for a change because people will want to, there's been a lot of work to put the new standards in place, and how they're going to be measured is basically the same as they have been, although with a movement towards outcomes, as, as he said. And I agree that this, system drives a quality assurance type process and there's little evidence of value with respect to improve outcomes. So Stephen's new approach consists, uh, includes annual collection of hospital data at the clinical unit level, this is what we need, context specific improvement plans and then external monitoring of goals with an additional active response approach to safety assurance using these short notice visits which have been done overseas and just beginning to be tested um, in some parts of Australia. He also emphasises stronger board oversight of um, the whole process and public and, and much stronger public reporting. As a doctor myself, I'm, I'm aware of the general lack of engagement of doctors in the current accreditation approach. We've sort of got to be dragged kicking and screaming into this week of improvement that's then demonstrated while we get on with our everyday business every day of the year. And I think that doctors are no undoubtedly will respond more to a clinical unit response to drive improvement, which supports their own ethical drive to deliver best care. And I think. Stephen made this point when he said he doesn't think doctors usually get up in the morning and think how much they can damage people. We really do get up in the morning and think how much we can help people. And there's a set of sort of a moral issue about there and a, and a strongly professional issue, as well as a set of sense of natural which, competitiveness, which can also drive improvement. But given this emphasis on data and improvement at the clinical level, I just, I just, observe a word of warning because it's very easy within hospitals to get driven into silos. The cardiac department only thinks about cardiology and the renal department only thinks about kidneys. 
and people have got a bit of lots of people have got a bit of everything, and and the com the hospital needs to work as a community as a whole too. So whatever we do about driving improvement through the clinical levels, we have to be also thinking about the hospital as a whole and how we operate as a community, how we collaborate, how we're consistent across whatever systems need to be improved. And, and I think that's really required by a hospital, not only to improve health outcomes for each of the patients, but to have a responsibility towards the population that that health system serves. I was also interested in Stephen's uh, suggestion about possibly withdrawing college accreditation for training posts in clinical units that perform at the lower end of the market. I would say that that's easier said than done, having had a long history in college accreditation. I was president of the College of Physicians a number of years ago. Not only that colleges are difficult um, systems to move, but also that there's a lot of specialty groups that are very influential in colleges, particularly that the two big colleges that operate within hospital systems, physicians and surgeons. So they've got to deal not only with the college, but the specialty societies that all have an interest in these areas. So I think it's a good idea, <laughs> but I think it would be difficult to do. It certainly would add a strong incentive for improvement. But I just do question, I'd like to ask you the question, Stephen, if you're always going to try and improve the bottom 10%, even if there was significant improvement, there always will be a bottom 10%. So how could you ever get everybody uh, to support training? But that's just a little mathematical argument, I think. But it's also, this argument is also very relevant to my responsibilities as president of the Australian Medical Council, which sets the standards for and accredits training institutions against those standards for medical schools, for intern training providers, and for the specialist colleges. Now, the, the specialist college standards do provide do do consider quality and safety in a number of the areas, but I, I, I've reread them thinking about all of this, and we, we don't really have enough in there about quality improvement. We've got we've got some overarching statements about quality and safety, and I think that's something that the that the AMC could look at in improving standards in the future. Now I'll finish by commenting on health outcomes from a broader perspective which is held very strongly by members of the Victorian Clinical Council. As well as improving health outcomes resulting from in hospital services, we've got to find ways to measure, monitor and improve outcomes from a whole of system perspective. Health services have a responsibility to ensure as much as possible the ongoing care and improvement in health of their patients once they're discharged back into the community. This is what matters to people. Having a safe episode of care in hospital is very important to individuals, but staying well and avoiding return to hospital is equally, if not more important. So perhaps some of the savings which could result from improved and safer hospital care could be used to improve and connect with community care. Thank you. Hi there. Hello, everybody. I know we're running slightly behind time, so I'm going to whisk through. I'm Linda Swan, I'm the Chief Medical Officer of Medibank, and it's my great pleasure to be here this afternoon in this beautiful building. I wanted to talk to you from the perspective of a payer and talk to you about some practical examples of what we're trying to do to encourage a safer, safer system in Australian hospitals. And um, I wanted in particular to highlight the fact that we're working in a number of different areas, but I thought before I got into the detail of what we're doing around hospital safety, it would be really quite bizarre of me not to acknowledge the fact that private health insurance at the moment is a bit on the nose. There's a lot of negative press about private health insurance, a lot of people concerned about what's happening in our industry. And if you get to the heart of people's concerns, it's about the fact that private health insurance is just increasing in cost year after year. And those costs are increasing faster than CPI. What often people don't understand is that healthcare costs are not the same as CPI. So we see healthcare costs increasing often at twice the rate of CPI. Nonetheless, we've got consumers in a world where they're saying we don't want to pay for expensive health insurance anymore because we don't really see that it's delivering value and or I can't afford it. So if you were running that type of business, then surely you'd try and address those two factors. You'd try and say, what could I do to increase value or what could I do to try and drive down costs? And that's what we're doing as a business. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about the things we're doing to try and improve costs, 
but I wanted to quickly touch on the fact that we do also care about the value piece. There is a range of different initiatives that we've got in place or that we're launching that's about delivering better value for people that hold private health insurance. How can we help people with chronic diseases prevent hospitalisations? How can we help providers deliver better care by helping with integration? How can we ensure that there's things in place to prevent people getting, place in, getting sick in the first place? So I won't do it justice by a quick overview, but I just thought it might be obvious to you all that we're only talking about one side of the equation if we're not looking at what we can do to improve care and prevent care as well as save costs. But if you look at the area of healthcare savings and you look at it, uh, the health as a system, one of the most recognised and established models that you can do to improve healthcare is the triple aim. And this is about saying that if you're going to try and improve healthcare, you look for things that improve health outcomes, the experience of healthcare, and lower healthcare costs. So when we're, as a business, focusing on ways that we can save costs, this is the paradigm that we use to shape our thinking. And we've been talking a bit about hospital complications. Well, hospital complications clearly hits all three of these areas. It's a bad experience for the person involved, it often drives increased costs, and it clearly isn't a good outcome from care. So you can understand why, as a health insurer or a payer, you're interested in things like uh, complications. I wanted to talk about the fact, though, that um, as a payer of healthcare and someone who cares about the quality of care that our members get, we fully recognise that we are only one small part of the picture. Really, the key relationship is between the provider of the care and the patient. We're doing what we can to try and assist and strengthen that relationship. What we do have is access to an enormous amount of data, and that data can be used to help drive improvement, to help show where there might be performance differences, and in some cases to think about incentives. So we've been looking at how we can use the assets that we have to try and improve the system to deliver better outcomes, a better experience, and ideally lower costs for the healthcare system. We've been doing that um, with a model that really involves, I won't go into this in too much detail, but it basically is about identifying where there are areas for improvement, working with people to try and agree what those focus areas might be, using things like report, reports and publicity to drive change, and then doing a bit of a virtual circle and coming back and checking again whether you've made the difference that you anticipated. Some of the things that we've been doing that you might have heard about are variance reports. I think by virtue of the fact that you're here in the State Library after work talking about quality and safety, you probably understand the importance of variance or the fact that where you see a greater deal of variation, it really makes you question whether there is an agreement about what a good quality standard is. We've been working very constructively with the College of Surgeons to develop these variance reports and they've shown some really interesting insights. I'll, I'll get onto a little bit more of the statistics later. Another thing that we've been doing with hospital groups is using our data to benchmark hospitals. So whilst hospitals can look at their own data and their own performance, they're not often given the opportunity to know where they sit compared with their peers, particularly in the private health sector. We've got access to that information and we've worked with hospitals to develop a set of clinical indicators that be can be used to benchmark hospitals, not only on a hospital to hospital basis, but also by comparing different craft groups. So these types of reports have been um, very actively discussed with private hospitals in a very collaborative and collegiate manner, and we've had some very positive discussions about where change can occur. So we have demonstrated both through our relationships with specialists and with hospitals that if you spend the time to work collaboratively with people to analyse data and identify areas for improvement, you can get change occurring. So this is another set of data. One of the uh, most interesting learnings is about the value of patient reported experience measures, which many people would regard as not high science. However, in terms of driving improvement, it can be a great motivator for hospitals. Everybody likes to see themselves as delivering fantastic experience for the people in their care. 
This is a um, summary report of one of our higher performers. Green is good, red is back, bad. And you can see a lot of green bars uh, for this particular hospital group. So you would imagine when we presented these, re these results, they sat back and went, good on us, we're doing everything right. Well, that's not what happened. They went straight to the red bar to go, hang on a minute, why aren't we green in that area? What is going on in our performance as a group that we're not uh, leading the industry in every single one of our um, parameters? And we spent quite a bit of time drilling down to the data to try and understand that particular, I'm not sure if you can measure it, you can see it, but that particular measure is about communication with patients. So it's just an example that even the highest performers will welcome data that shows where they are outliers and where they can improve. So we've had, um, had very positive discussions around sharing things as simple as PREMS data. This is some of the results of the surgical variance reports that I talked about before. Clearly when you get this degree of variation, when there are a number of specialists that are, have 100% of their patients staying overnight after a hernia repair, and you've got another relatively high number of surgeons who'd never do it, that that degree of variability suggests that there's probably somewhere in the middle that should be agreed as a standard. What we've done in this particular instance, we also commissioned some research, and it was, a, again, a process that we worked with the College of Surgeons to, um, to deliver the research, and, and what it demonstrated at the end was that there was a very significant difference in terms of the number of people who stayed overnight after a hernia repair in Australia compared with other parts of the world, and that there was no really good clinical explanation for why that should or could be um, occurring. And the College of Surgeons were happy to come out in quite a, a manner of um, significant leadership to say, this isn't right, we think there should be a benchmark set, and that benchmark that they'd agreed to is about 80%. So about 80% of hernia procedures should be day stay, not overnight stay. So it sounds relatively trivial, but that type of initiative can, when it's rolled out across everybody who has a hernia repair in a private hospital, if 80% of those people stayed in just for a day stay and not overnight, you're talking about significant savings. So we've been working with hospitals to propagate this type of information, to work with them and the surgeons to see how we can change behaviour to ensure that people do get home on the same day. Another area of great variation is around the rate of rehabilitation. You might have heard some of the press about this, but there's far higher rates of inpatient rehabilitation occurring in private hospitals, far higher in Australia than in the vast majority of places anywhere else in the world. And there's also enormous amount of variation. So it's another area of concern. It's a growing area of cost to us as a, as a payer. And there's not good evidence that people are obtaining better outcomes by staying in hospital versus being at home. One of the things we've launched recently is a program we, we now offer our members choice. So you can choose to have your rehab in a hospital or at home. And we're happy to say that a large number of people are choosing to have their rehabilitation at home. They enjoy the experience, they report a very good experience of their care, and we're seeing outcomes comparable with um, the stays that they get in the hospital at a reduced cost. So then we get to the issue of creating incentives. So we can use our data to try and um, drive behaviour change. As a payer, you would think that it might be logical that we look at financial incentives. But as Stephen's already talked about, the evidence that financial incentives drive behaviour change is quite variable. Nonetheless, it's another lever. And I always look at it a bit like trying to reduce the rate of smoking. There wasn't a single thing that suddenly meant that a lot of Australians um, stopped smoking. But over the course of 20 years, through a range of different initiatives, we have seen a dramatic change in the number of Australians smoke. And I think the same could be said for a lot of the things we do in healthcare. It's not a single thing. It's going to be a range of initiatives that drive behaviour change. So type of, the type of financial incentives that we have considered uh, are doing things in terms of our contracts with hospitals. That's the most obvious place where we might be able to put in place a financial incentive. And we did go through the process a couple of years ago of considering, I don't know how to get rid of that box, of considering if we could incentivise hospital-acquired complications. 
Unfortunately, it resulted in a media storm. It was seen that it was in, entirely inappropriate for us to be saying that we didn't want to pay in every incidence for the additional cost of a hospital complication. Uh, I think if there was one great thing that came out of all that press, there was a raised awareness of the fact that hospital complications are something that need to be addressed. In many instances, they were increasing um, at rates that you wouldn't expect in, in the, the developed world that we're in. And we had an opportunity to really engage with hospitals on a much more meaningful level to show them the data and show them why we were concerned. We put in place a process where there was a small range of complications, but if a hospital um, had, for instance, a fall, and that resulted in us having an additional charge for treating that person in hospital because of that fall, we asked them to show us that they had shown their own, they had followed their own guidelines in trying to avoid that fall. If they weren't able to show us that they had followed their own guidelines and there was a fall that occurred in the hospital, then on that instance we said we wouldn't pay for the additional cost of that, or that was incurred through that fall. And um, so it's not actually a huge financial penalty for the hospitals. It's a relatively small number of events and an even smaller number of them where the hospital's not able to demonstrate that they followed good guidelines. But nonetheless, we saw quite dramatic changes in terms of the number of hospital-acquired complications in private hospital groups. So this is the summary of three years of data. Some of our major outliers, which are the bright blue lines, have seen very significant reductions in the number of hospital-acquired complications. And in almost every instance, you've seen a trend towards a decreasing number of hospital-acquired complications. So I don't think this was the financial incentive. The financial incentive was actually quite small. Maybe it was the press coverage, maybe it was the discussion that was happening at our, our quarterly contract meetings, maybe it was other things that the Quality Commission were doing. It was a range of different things that happened over that three-year period, but we have seen a material change in the number of hospital-acquired complications that are being reported to us um, through our systems. I think I'll probably talk to that slide. So some of the challenges of trying to put in place incentives. Um, as I've said, financial measures are, are challenging. It's challenging to agree who really benefits from a change in behaviour within a hospital setting. Is it the hospital? Is it the payer? Is it the patient? Sometimes it's even different uh, parts of government that might benefit from an initiative. So it's hard to work out how you incentivise and who you incentivise. We have found that there's been some really big issues with trust. So until we can find a world where hospitals and providers and funders can sit together and work out sensible ways that we can improve our healthcare system, we're probably going to see healthcare costs increasing at far greater than CPI for many years to come, and we're probably going to see private health insurance costs increasing far higher than CPI for years to come. Now, while that might not um, worry many of you, particularly if you don't hold private health insurance, it does have a flow-on effect to, to public hospitals. What we're finding is that, unfortunately, as costs go up, people drop out of private health insurance. They assume, of course, that they could get access to the high-quality public system that we have. But whilst um, that public system uh, is working well, and waiting lists certainly in many areas have decreased over the last years, if you have an influx of people that no longer hold private health insurance and these people move into the public health, it's obviously going to have an impact there. The other perverse thing that happens is if you get people dropping out of private health insurance, the people who drop out are the people who are least likely to need it, sensibly. The people who drop out go, the young people, the healthy people, I don't really need private health insurance, which actually means our costs increase faster than ever. So you end up in a virtual downward spiral. Um, and you, so you can imagine, as funders of healthcare, why we are trying to find ways to challenge the system, drive behaviour change, and see if there's sensible ways that we can manage our healthcare costs. So I'll leave it there. I'm very happy to um, take any questions. I think we might be at that point in the evening, so thank you.
Uh, thanks very much, uh, Linda, and thank you, Jill, as well. Um, and my apologies to all for my speaking so long, which curtailed our question time. Um, we've got a few minutes for questions. I will be hanging around here afterwards, so if you've got questions that, if your question doesn't get called, please come up to see me afterwards. So are there any questions of any of us? And there's a, right at the back, Brian. Can you say who you are? I'm Brian Hanning. I'm the medical director of the Australian Health Service Alliance, which probably everyone here has never heard of. But we're, a, we're, a, we're an outsourcing company and we are responsible directly for funding about 20% of private health care in the country. The question I had is really directed to any or all of the panellists. Do you think it's realistic to believe that we could ever find a single number to um, measure quality of clinical care? And if we did, do you think it would actually show a lot of variation between hospitals or minor variation with maybe just a single or occasional low outlier? So we had the slide up there which looked at the deciles and there was a huge spread um, between the best 10% and the worst 10% and, and everybody in between. And that, that, was, that is the case for more or less every measure, every type of complication we looked at. Um, uh, we, haven't looked, we haven't done this, but I suspect that is also true for specialties. So when you drill down. Um, so I, I think there is large variation in, I think we have demonstrated there's large variation in complications in the way we measure it and the same is true of I think any other way you measure it. Um, yeah, uh, and so because there is large variation it means there's potential to improve. I think that one of the points that uh, Jill made is an interesting one about the statistics. As it turns out, if you just focus on the worst 10%, you don't get as much improvement than if you try and change the median or the average. If you focus on everybody who's not in the worst 10%, there's, there's much more improvement. More, more people are affected in the improvement than you just focus on the bottom 10% because the bottom 10% is only 10%. So my view is you need to be trying to shift the overall pattern as well as trying to focus on the, uh, trying to shift the, the bottom 10%. There was, yep. Uh, thanks very much. I'm uh, Jack Dalliwell. I'm a GP, a medical director at uh, My Home GP, an out of house provider, and also a uh, clinical director at Aged Care GP. Um, and I've got a question around uh, quality assurance, quality improvement, and public perceptions. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, all of us living in the era of Trump, we know that uh, just because something's logical doesn't necessarily mean it's going to get done. The other driver for change is perception and public perceptions. And thinking back to my experiences as a medical director in, in England, um, one of the things that we found was, although all the evidence shows that the way we should be going is towards quality improvement, there would be you know, a medical, you know, infamous core celebra. So there's Mid Staffordshire in the UK and Winterbourne. These are sort of famous names, kind of awful things that happened in, in various sectors in, in healthcare. And what then happens is there's a public pressure and then the, the tabloids get on board. Something must be done. You know, we want a policeman or police, you know, police officer who has a truncheon, who beats quality out of the health system. And actually what then that happens is politicians get involved and you get another layer of regulation put on top. And what I remember that felt like as a medical director was we would spend all our time feeding the beast rather than actually focusing on quality assurance, quality improvement. We would be trying to fill in various bits of paperwork, trying to look after regulators who are going to sweep into us. How on earth do we make sure that we don't fall into that same trap in Australia? Because these disasters will happen and the pressure will mount for something to be done. I, I used to be opposed to public reporting for that sort of reason, that I felt that it would lead to naming and shaming and blaming and you know would just create a very unhealthy unhelpful atmosphere in terms of quality improvement. I've changed my views on that partly because I didn't feel that enough was happening and I think hospitals respond to reputational risk. Linda talked about that a lot uh, in, in her presentation and I think that would help. Um, the, the evidence from overseas 
is that public report that the consumers actually don't use public the public reports they don't take any notice of them but the hospitals do and the hospitals respond to the public reporting not the consumers and so it, it does help in in actually lifting the game and so as I said I, I, I accept the risk that you're talking about but in the end I decided that that's why I shifted my view that I think it does help in improvement but I agree with you that it, it, we do have to help. We do have to work with the tabloids, do you? <laughs> if you want to, well, you got exposed to the tabloids, Linda, in, in, in yeah, so. Yeah, I think it's a, a, a risk that we need to consider when we're thinking about public reporting, but I agree with Stephen. The evidence would have it that if you don't public re, re, publicly report, the degree of change that you get is far less than if you have the exposure that I think it's not all just about reputation. It's as you've described, Jill, it's a bit of the competitiveness. Nobody wants to be the worst. Everybody would like to be the best. And so there's a natural strive for improvement that is a lot more strengthened if your peers know about your performance. So I'm, I'm very pro-transparency, provided it's done in a way that's sensible and meaningful. There was one there. Sorry. Um, thank you. Um, I'm Wendy Benson. I'm a consumer advocate and a patient. <coughs> Sorry. Um, two things, Linda. First, first is it's fantastic to hear that Medibank are moving towards the um, at home care. Um, I was a um, stem cell transplant recipient and was able to have my um, antibiotic care at home, which greatly helped me um, get over my stem cell transplant. That's number one. But number two, um, I'm on quite a few committees at, at a couple of our public hospitals and I don't understand why we as, um, as a federal, federal government and state governments, why we don't have medical care that is all the same. So if we look at um, just the hospitals that I'm involved with here in Victoria have different rules to their hospital counterparts in New South Wales. And I just don't understand how it can't just all be put into a big pool and say, this is what's best practice for everyone, not just this state. That's for you, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks, Stephen. Look, I, th I think there are big efforts being made in a variety of ways to decrease that sort of variation that you've talked about and the clinicians and the clinical, you know, the sort of specialty areas work with things like clinical practice guidelines, the um, Australian Commission for Safety and Quality in healthcare has been developing clinical care standards. These are the sorts of areas of work that are supposed to reduce variation in care. Um, but the reality in our, in our system is that we have widely varying governance arrangements in our federated system. Both Queensland and New South Wales tend to be top-down health department generated. So in New South Wales, the health department could say, you've got to use these clinical guidelines for these conditions in every single hospital and you've got to, and you've got to do it. In, in Victoria, or the, for many years now, the health services have been much more independent and there's been very many advantages to that. But it means that uh, local conditions, uh, local context can change the way care is delivered. There's also issues about workforce capability and distribution of workforce capability that's also very, that's also very significant. So, uh, you know, I absolutely hear your plea and, and I think it is hard to understand but there's very many complex reasons behind that variation and I think again, you know, we go back to public reporting of data because that, I think, as we're all saying, if it's done well and fairly, um, in other words, risk adjusted and so on for different contexts, that's the sort of thing that will drive that reduction. And even when we have um, or, uh, systems like clinical guidelines for particular conditions, their clinical guidelines are developed under certain circumstances and, and people vary as individuals, as you would know, both in, in their own health conditions, but also 
the context of where they live, who they live with, their own attention to prevention and other, other areas. So that, there's that huge variability to, to take into account as well. So we've got a long way to go, but I think we're on that pathway. Thanks. One last question was over here somewhere. Peter. So we uh, say who you are. Um, I'm Peter McNair. I'm not represent. This is not a view of the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, Stephen, we we've known for a long time that when you try and and get that cost equation right around the reduction in, in you know, the cost savings from complications. And you know, that, that doesn't work. Uh, often because we employ an extra person or we put in a, an extra system. It took about 10 years before we worked out how to prevent uh, uh, hospital acquired infections with hand washing. You know, we went from the, the hand washing police to essentially a piece of cardboard above patients' beds. So the question to, to, to you, Stephen, is your report going to uh, include sort of strategies for identifying the, the organisations that do a good job of that and operationalise that well with operational detail. I guess the question for you, uh, Professor Sewell, is, is, you know, what's the, the role of the Victorian Clinical Council around that and what's your view of the level of granularity that the Clinical Council needs to get to with regard to recommendations beyond consensus guidelines, which is sort of where we are. So we're not allowed to identify individual hospitals. You know, our data allows us to identify individual hospitals. We're not allowed to name them. Um, and the, the names of all the hospitals have been taken off the data set in any event. So we do have hospital level data, but we're not allowed to identify them. And that in turn means we can't actually say this is the best hospital and, and what is it that this hospital does that actually is working. So we, it'd be a good thing to do, but we actually can't do that. But we are, what we are trying to do is just show the huge variation that's occurring within a system which most Australians think that all the hospitals are doing the same sort of thing and doing it well, but they're not. I think for the perspective of the Victorian Clinical Council, we haven't been set up to go granular. We meet on four days per year at three monthly intervals to discuss a, to discuss a problem overall. And we, uh, our, our role is to provide high level systems advice to the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services. But Safer Care Victoria has been set up to look at the granularity and to, do the, to, to improve implementation. And they, they will be doing that in all sorts of ways, some of it certainly by describing good practice and finding ways to operationalise that in, in other areas. And one of the questions for Safer Care Victoria, I think, is what forcing um, approaches can they use versus what information providing and bottom-up type approaches. And, and in Victoria, that's probably harder than in some of the other states because of what I just said before about the, the relative independence of the health services. But that's the, your question really goes to Safer Care Victoria. That's been set up and funded and you know the expertise is within it to, to develop those um, fine details about implementation. So thank you very much and I'll be here for further questions if you want to ask me. I'd like to thank Linda and Jill for very, very interesting uh, presentations, especially I found them very, very useful. I'd like to thank you for joining us. I'd like to thank the State Library of Victoria for providing venue. So if you could join with me and Thanking everybody. <laughs>